Hey everybody, um, I may have to get up from this video at some point. Um, I have to keep my dog outside because he's, we were playing and now he's breathing like some kind of Hollywood movie stalker creep from the 80s or 90s that's on the phone like, <sighs> so <clears throat> I don't want that in the video, so, but if he starts whining and it's even worse, might have to let him in here just so you know. Um, okay, this video is going to be um, on the concept of kinship, and we will get into um, things that are related to kinship a little bit later on, especially marriage. Um, but basically, this seems like it's an obvious subject that wouldn't need a video. But a lot of concepts in cultural anthropology are kind of like that. That's what that's what can make them tricky is because they is because they seem like common sense, but actually um, common sense is common because it's it's your perception in from your cultural perspective, and so that makes it seem universal and real. You don't even question it. Um, <clears throat> so when we talk about kinship in in our society, um, I know that we all have our own different families, different backgrounds, um, different ethnic affiliations, different religious affiliations, and so on and so forth. But I think that um, a lot of folks, regardless of those things, um, in the U.S., at least are familiar with a kind of kinship system where... Um, when you ask, like, who are your closest relatives, people will say siblings, parents, grandparents, you know, cousins, um, you know, and they may feel emotionally more close to one grandparent over the others or something, but there's no real difference in terms of expectations or in terms of... Um, degree of relatedness from, say, one set of grandparents to another. And uh, that's not how it works in all societies. Um, so in, in the U.S. and in a lot of the sort of industrialized capitalists, um, I, I say that, not, um, I know it may, may seem strange, I haven't really explained why I always use that as a, um, a descriptor, but it actually does play a big role in how um, cultural development has proceeded in the last, you know, 200 years, let's say. And it's changed a lot of things about our social structures and organizations and globalization, although it's not a new phenomenon, has rapidly increased over that time. So, so it's pertinent to say that. But anyway, um, I think... Um, the idea of your kin as being people who you are biologically related to is the most common way of understanding it in our society. Um, <clears throat> could be wrong, but uh, we, we tend to not make large distinctions between our mother's side of the family and our father's side of the family Again, aside from like personal issues you may have with them. However, it's not like that everywhere. So we're going to talk about like what is a kinship system and what are some possibilities of kinship systems in other cultures. So the way that we're going to define kinship, um, the way that we're going to operationalize it, I believe I took this from the textbook, uh, is as the system of meaning and power created to determine who is related to whom and how, and to define their mutual expectations, rights, and responsibilities. I should have a comma there. Whoops. Um, so we are very like uh, medicalized and and scientific in terms of our epistemology these days. Regardless of whether you or anyone you know personally is is religious. The way that we think about the world is kind of irrevocably um, empiricized. I don't even know if that's a word, but uh, 
but we can't help but think the most obvious way to think of how you're related to people is through biology. Um, however, beyond biology, um, there's actually there can actually be different sets of expectations, different types of inheritance. Um, think of think of like medieval kings and queens um, in in Europe and and elsewhere. And even even modern day royal families, oftentimes they are patrilineal, which we'll get into in a second. Meaning, uh, you know, the bloodline really passes through the, the father. You know, so there's a different kind of relationship there um, between mother side and father side, and so on and so forth. And so, so <clears throat> kinship has to do with things like um, the order of inheritance of different things, uh, who you can count on for support, um, for help in difficult times, for backup in, in, in conflict, for example. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a method of social organization and it goes from the small scale of the family unit, whatever that might be, to a, a, a larger scale like um, an extended family, a lineage, a clan, a tribe, <clears throat> and so on. So there's, there's another quote uh, down there at the bottom that says, because the world of kin is a world of expectations and obligations, it is fundamentally a moral world charged with feeling. So you have, again, remember culture is symbolic and kinship is symbolic and we communicate through this symbolism that's shared and understood. And if there are certain expectations, like a parent is supposed to do this for a child, a child is supposed to do this for a parent, um, or, you know, um, your, your relationship with your cousins or um, because there are symbolic relationships that um, come with certain expectations and obligations. Obviously, there's um, where there are expectations and obligations, there's oftentimes intense feeling, especially if someone doesn't meet those obligations or expectations. Right. Think about like the uh, this is this is a tangent and these are this is why my videos are so long. I'm sorry, but think about like the five love languages if you've ever heard that. Some people show their love through words of affirmation. Oh, baby, I love you. You're so great. Oh, you're so smart. Some people aren't really all about that. Some people show their love through um, through touch, through hugging or massaging or kissing. Um, I mean, obviously, you can do more than one of these at any given time, but uh, some people show their love through gift giving, and oftentimes you you expect love to be shown back the same way, right? And because you have this expectation, um, if that expectation is not met, you take it personally, right? Let's say you're you, you show your love through words of affirmation, and you kind of expect that. You kind of expect that. Um, your partner is going to say, I love you and all kinds of wonderful things to you, but maybe they show their love in terms of gift giving or, um, or, you know, spending quality time with you, making certain sacrifices or whatever. That's all fine and good. But as a person who expects them to say, you know, explicitly, I love you. You're so great. If you don't, if you don't get that back, that causes conflict in the relationship, right? So oftentimes, expectations, obligations, um, that's where you can find conflict in human relationships, right? So the, the world of kinship is a world of expectations and obligations. So it is a moral world charged with feeling. That's kind of what that means. So what are the functions of a kinship system? Carry out the reproduction of legitimate group members. What does that mean? Well, it means like, um, like again, going back to this royals example, if the um, queen had an affair with some plebeian, some commoner, 
um, and had had this commoner's baby. Obviously, uh, if if the bloodline of the royalty passed through the king, hypothetically, then that child of the queen's would would be cut off from that royalty. They would be an illegitimate child. Not because there's anything wrong with that child, but because socially that was part of the understanding of kinship and the understanding of a, of a patrilineage, right? So one of the functions of kinship is to decide who is a legitimate member of this group and who is not a legitimate member of this group. Um, and I know it sounds kind of arbitrary and made up, but you will find as we go through uh, this semester that most of the things that we take for granted culturally are kind of arbitrary. I mean, that's not to say there's no reasons for them at all, but it could just as easily be one way as another. Um, and we tend to call those cultural constructions, um, but that doesn't mean they're not real to us. They are very real. So anyway, that's one of the functions, carry out reproduction of legitimate group members. Um, Resonance rules, meaning like who lives with whom. When you get married, do you go off and have your own house or do you move into the wife's family's village or the husband's family's village? Um, so kinship systems often have, you know, rules, whether they're explicit or not about that. Descent rules and patterns. Um, how you trace your relationships to other people outside your family. Um, so, you know, most of us, I'm, again, I'm generalizing here. So I could be, could be completely wrong about you and your family. Um, let, me, let me use myself as an example. On my dad's side, he was one of 11 living children. Um, and... As you can imagine, I have, I don't know how many dozens of cousins. Ooh, dozens of cousins. Um, and I don't even know most of them. I barely know any of them. Um, in fact, uh, I mean, my, my parents, I was born in a different state than my parents are from. And so we really didn't get to visit uh, my grandparents and uncles and aunts and cousins more than once a year. So I still haven't met a lot of my cousins on my dad's side anyway. So do I consider them family? I mean, I know I'm biologically related to them, but if I saw a random cousin on the street, I don't know that I would realize who they were. Um, however, in other families, there are you know, big extended families who are extremely close and have grown up together. And sometimes you consider cousins to be siblings, basically. But how far back do you go with tracing who you're related to? If you've taken one of these um, ancestry testing uh, kits or whatever, uh, like Ancestry DNA or 23andMe and stuff like that, I don't know if 23andMe does this, but Ancestry DNA does it where they will tell you. Um, if someone else who's taken it is related to you. And sometimes it'll be like six times removed, you know, like six degrees of separation, literally, or more. Um, the bottom line is the further you go back, the more people you're related to, right? And then if you, and then, you know, let's say you go back to your like great, 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 great grandparents. Well, there could be someone who doesn't look like you, doesn't think like you, uh, doesn't live like you, doesn't live near you, that's related to one of your great-great-great-great-grandparents because that, there's a lot of people on that level who had a lot of kids, right? So most of us don't trace our kinship that far in any meaningful way. We might, we can, we might think it's interesting, but, you know, unless you're going to one of these really huge, like, family reunions that anyone... Like, imagine your name is Smith. Like, oh, my God, how many Smiths are going to be at this reunion? Um, like, most of us have a fairly circumscribed idea of who we're related to, you know. But in some societies, um, you at least claim 
to be able to trace your ancestors back to some mythical person. And anyone else who claims to be able to trace ancestors back to this mythical person, uh, they're part of your, your clan or maybe your tribe. And that carries certain responsibilities and obligations. Okay, so there are different ways of doing this. Succession of positions. So if there are inherited, um, like, positions like in a royal um, uh, system, like, um, you know, where, where a position of power, like a king or a queen, will, will pass through a defined side of the bloodline, um, that would be succession of position. Um, and inheritance of material goods, essentially, okay? So <clears throat> there are different uh, types of kin relations. So uh, the nuclear family is, is but one iteration of family, right? Uh, which is parents and children. And not everybody, you know, not all societies live together in nuclear families, Um it's, I think it's probably pretty common, but it's not exclusively nuclear families. Um, and that, so the, the way that the children are related to the parents and the children are related to each other is called consanguineal. Um, and if I don't have this written down in a slide, I will make a note of it um, and post it on Canvas. But consanguineal means you share blood, like... Literally, that's what it means, uh, but it means like you are biologically related to each other. Um, now, when you are married, uh, at least in our society, in most cases, you're not biologically related to that person you marry, right? You don't share any traceable amounts of genetic material with that person uh, from any time recently, anyhow. And so... That is called a final um, kinship. So a final means you're not related by blood, but you are sort of legally bound or bound through, through ritual or ceremony um, to this person through marriage, basically. Um, or you, like your father-in-law, you know, that's in a final kinship you know, because you, you don't share blood with that person. Um, okay, adoption uh, is, is a, um, it's kind of a version of what anthropologists might call um, uh, fictive kinship, meaning that <clears throat> it's not through blood, I suppose it could be, but let's just say hypothetically, it's it's uh, we're talking about cases that are not like you're not blood related to this person. Um, so it's not through blood. Uh, it's not really through marriage. Uh, it is a an agreed upon formal way to bring someone into your kin group. So in our society, that's that's done through legal means. Um, through the process of adoption. In other societies, it could be done through certain, certain um, groups. Like um, if you belong to a, a specific group with other people where you go through some rite of initiation um, and you owe loyalty to each other, there may be some fictive kinship relation where you see each other as siblings, for example. Um, so here's some other examples of fictive kin, sort of in our society, um, fraternities and sororities. I mean, you have these names for each other, like, um, sisters, brothers, bigs and littles. And it is a fictitious in, in the sense of it's not through blood, um, and it's not through marriage, um, but it is a type of, of, you think of each other as kin, right? You think of each other like you owe each other some kind of loyalty or there are some kinds of obligations and expectations beyond what you would give to some random person, right? Um, so these guys on the left, I don't know. It's like the bro pound, I don't know. 
Um, but fictive kin, okay, so that's another one. Now, uh, I don't know necessarily that this strictly goes with kinship, but but this this idea of who you're related to, possibly in some way, who you have something in common with, and who you feel like you owe something to or vice versa or there's obligations or expectations ethnicity can be kind of a part of that and in a way it's a type of fictive kinship um, or imagined community because whatever ethnic identity you uh, subscribe to you have most likely I, I would be willing to bet everything I own which is very little uh <laughs> It's still what I own. Um, I would be willing to bet that all all jokes aside, because I've heard people say, like, in whatever community they're in, if it's a small community, especially in the U.S., like, oh, everybody knows each other, whatever. But I would be willing to bet that for the most part, you don't know everyone who would claim that particular ethnic identity, right? So if it's Irish-American or Mexican-American or Irish or Mexican or... You know, whatever you want to come up with. Have you met every single person who would identify that way? Probably not. So, um, but you imagine them as part of your community, right? You imagine that you must have something in common with this person that you might not have in common with your neighbor, right? If your neighbor is from a different ethnic uh, identity, right? So, um, it itself in a way is is a is a extension of kinship okay now when we when we are showing how kinship works in different societies oftentimes we'll use kinship diagrams and there are symbols in these diagrams to show you how people are related to one another um, in terms of consanguineal and a final relationships and so there's different ways of doing it but the way when we talk about it um, in lectures, um, the way that we're gonna talk about it is using a triangle for male, a circle for female, uh, a line that connects two symbols underneath for marriage, uh, a line that connects two symbols above for sibling relationships. And then uh, if someone is deceased, there'll be a slash through their symbol. We don't use this really in any of the examples in this lecture, but if someone is divorced, you could also put a slash through uh, through the line that connects their uh, symbols in marriage, okay? So, as I said, three ways to categorize kinship types of relations, consanguineal, based on descent from a common ancestor, a final, based on marital ties, and pseudo-kinship or fictive kinship, which is based on ritual or legal ties. Um, so when we are, um, talking about how someone is related to other people in a kinship diagram, that person, that's our point of reference, uh, we call ego. It's some convention that when, um, anthropologists really started doing this more, they use, right? So ego is, is the, um, uh, the point of reference, okay? So in this in this case, ego right here is a female, right? Because this is a circle. Um, and this other circle here is ego's sister, okay? Because they're siblings, the line is connected on the top and they are children of these two, this uh, male and female, the mother and father. Here are the father's siblings, the father's parents, um, and, oops, oopsie, um, and let's say, uh, over here, um, these are, this is, this is the mother's brother and, um, his wife and their children and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, okay. Broadly. You could break down kinship systems into two primary types. One is bilateral descent, also called cognatic descent. Um, and what that means is that 
you equally emphasize the relatives on your mother's and your father's sides. Okay, so um, so you trace descent through both sides, and there are obligations and expectations from each side, um, and it's fairly fairly equal. Um, then there's also unilineal descent, and Unilineal descent means you trace it through one side or another primarily. So there's matrilineal descent, which comes from the mother's side, the mother and mother, the mother, mother's 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 mother, right? Um, and patrilineal, which is father's 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 father. So um, if you have a sort of <clears throat> uh, European uh, or Western European type of naming system, uh, which, you know, even even people who whose cultural background doesn't usually do that in the U.S. Oftentimes, people to assimilate do it, um, and so you have like your father's name that came from his father, that came from his father, that came from his father. Nowadays, of course, uh, and for a while, that's that's been changing, and there's multiple ways of doing it, and we're recognizing. Um, you know, different possibilities, even, <clears throat> even on sometimes on legal forms and so forth. Um, but, you know, that's been the sort of traditional way to do it um, in the U.S. and other kind of like European influenced uh, um, societies for a while. And that's a patrilineal type of system. So, um, you know, the fact that my last name, Toussaint, was my dad's name, and that was his dad's name, and that was his dad's name, right? Uh, my mom's maiden name, she doesn't use anymore. Um, so that's sort of a holdover from a, a more um, full-blown patrilineal system in the past. Uh, nowadays, it's really kind of cognatic, I would say, in most of the U.S., um, you know, I don't inherit anything special from my dad's side of the, of the family than I do from my mom's side of the family, except my last name. Um, and I consider myself equally as related to those folks, and there aren't any different obligations for father's side versus mother's side. So, uh, so the name convention is a holdover from a patrilineal descent system. Uh, but really, in practice, we have a cognatic descent system. Hope that's not too confusing. So here are formal, some formal definitions. So bilateral or cognatic descent, the principle that a descent group is formed by people who believe they're related to each other by connections made through their mothers and fathers equally. Um, by a bilateral descent group is a group of people who claim to be related to one another through ties either from the mothers, mothers or the father's side to some common ancestor. Um, bilateral kindred is a kinship group that consists of the relatives of one person or group of siblings. Uh, unilineal descent, we have matrilineal and patrilineal descent, and we'll get into that a little more in a second. But looking at bilateral kindred, um, let's look at the bilateral kindred that ego one and ego two have in common. Uh, so ego one here, this is uh, ego one's brother and sister, and the you know the kids of ego one and their brother and sister, um, and this is the father and the mother. So ego one is related to the brother and the sister, um, all the kids, right? Ego one's children, ego one's nieces and nephews, but ego one is also related to the father's side of the family, so the father's parents, so these are ego one's grandparents, um, aunt and uncle through blood, um, and cousins and second cousins, right? Um, but also ego one is related to their mother, uh, their mother's parents, uh, their mother's siblings, so aunt and uncle, 
Um, they're cousins. So ego one and ego two are cousins um, and second cousins. Now for ego two, uh, ego two is related to their siblings, um, their nieces and nephews, their father, their father's parents up here, so their grandparents, and so on and so forth. But also ego two is related to their mother, their mother's parents, their aunt and uncle on their mother's side, and their, all their cousins on their mother's side. So the place where ego one and ego two overlap is this grayish, purplish area here in the middle, okay? Because, because this person here is not related to ego one through blood. It's a consanguineal tie. I mean, sorry, it's, a, it's in a final tie. It's, it's through marriage, right? So uh, because, again, this is ego one's mother, aunt, uncle, and this is, this is ego one's aunt through marriage, not through blood, right? So everyone on this side is not part of ego one's bilateral kindred. Okay. Um, so if we think about societies with bilateral or cognatic kindred today, we have um, most European and North American type uh, societies. Um, another example, this, this is not an exhaustive list, uh, but the, just to, to give you two examples, the Dobe Juansi, um, who are also sometimes referred to as the San, um, kind of an outdated term would be Bushmen. Um, they're a group of, not exclusively anymore, but um, used to be exclusively hunter-gatherer uh, within, within the last 50 years uh, or so. Um, and they live in the Kalahari Desert in uh, southwestern Africa. So, so yeah, so down here, uh, in uh, a region that spans parts of Namibia, Angola, Zambia, Botswana, and maybe a little bit of Zimbabwe. Um, so they, they have an, what's called an egalitarian band system. And we'll talk more about that when we talk about politics um, or political anthropology, because that's a type of, uh, you could say, political organization. Um, in terms of any way, like distributing powers, rights, um, responsibilities, decision making, and, and so forth. Um, their kinship system is kind of complicated. They are bilateral. They do have a bilateral kin kinship system. Um, so that's that's this regular system, right, where they're they consider themselves equally related to the mother's and the father's side of the family. Um, but they also have a name system uh, so that they only have a limited number of names that they use, like first names. And so you very easily can have the same first name as a lot of people. And that gives you a special kind of relationship, actually. Um, so aside from having a bilateral kinship system, there are also certain rules about who you can have a very casual, close relationship with that's referred to as a joking relationship because, you know, think of it like, um, obviously not everyone has the same relationship with, with their parents, but there are some things you might say or jokes you might make uh, or, I don't know, adult comments uh, that you, you probably wouldn't feel as comfortable making with or around your parents as you would your brothers and sisters or your friends or your cousins, right? Um, now, what about your children? Uh, there, there's certain things you probably wouldn't joke about or, or say around your children as well, right? So it's a similar system as that, except it's kind of formalized. Um, so you have a joking or casual relation, relationship uh, with people that are of your same kind of generation. Um, 
you have an of so-called avoidance relationship with your parents. Um, now, avoidance doesn't mean you actually avoid contact with them. It just means it's a more it's a more respectful, formalized kind of relationship. So, if you have taken uh, a Romance language uh, like Spanish or French, um, or actually a, a lot of different languages beyond that, um, I studied a bit of Polish as well, and 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 they have this system, and probably a lot of uh, a lot of languages do, where there are certain people you don't address, like uh, like like in in, in Spanish, like in. Um, at least in, say, like Mexican Spanish, right, uh, the use of tú for you versus usted, um, which is often a plural, but it also is used as a formal way to address uh, someone that's older than you or a stranger or someone in a position of power. Um, so just like French also has tú, and vous. Um, so that's, that's a similar kind of situation, right? So anyway, in, in the W. Juancy system, you have a joking relationship with people of your generation, an avoidance relationship with your parents, a joking relationship with your grandparents, an avoidance relationship with your great grandparents. So it skips a generation. Um, so you also have a, an avoidance relationship with your children, but your grandchildren you have a joking relationship with, okay? Now, what if your, um, your uncle, let's say you're, let's say you're named after your, your uncle. Now, your uncle is in your parents' generation, right? So you should have an avoidance relationship with your uncle. But typically when you have the same name, that automatically, well, not maybe not automatically, but it gives you the possibility to have a joking relationship with that person. When those systems conflict, you know, when the, when the person who has your name is in, is in a generational level that you should have an avoidance relationship with, there's a principle called we, where that older person will decide what kind of relationship you're going to have. So if they take it upon themselves to make it more of a casual joking relationship, then that's how it goes, okay? So anyway, there can be lots of, lots of complicated aspects to kinship systems. Um, now, as, as far as like where they live and how their kinship features into how they live, the Dobe Juan say they live in, in encampments because again, traditionally anyway, although this is changing, um, they have been hunter-gatherers, um, also sometimes called foragers. And so hunter-gatherers have to follow the resources. They have to follow the water. They have to follow the, um, the animals. And a lot of this is seasonal, wet seasons, dry seasons, depending on where you live. Um, and so you have to be kind of flexible about where you live. You're not putting down permanent residence somewhere for very long. So... It helps to have a, a flexible kinship system so that you can rely on help from kin on both sides of your family. So the way their encampments usually work is there's a um, there's a source of water like a lake or a pond, um, some some kind of a source of water at least at a particular time, and there's a core group of siblings that has kind of started the encampment there, or they're the oldest. Um, in their kin group from, from that encampment. Um, you know, maybe the ones who sort of founded this encampment have passed away, but this is, this is the core group of siblings there, a brother and a sister, and, and, you, can, and you can see that here. Now, uh, each of them can bring on their, uh, you know, husband or wife and their children so, so the, the sister brings on her husband, and if they have children, they can come. Um, the, the brother brings his wife and if they have children, they can be there as well. Um, now from there, you can sort of stretch the chain. So this, this husband now, uh, 
his sister, through her relationship with him, if she wants to, she can join the camp with her family, with her, her husband and their children, right? And so on and so forth. So you can easily like build this chain out so that people can come to this encampment. Now, if resources are scarce or if there's conflict be cer between certain members of the camp or if there's illness and, and people need to sort of disperse, um, the, this flexibility arrangement makes it pretty easy because, um, you know, I, any one of these people could use their connections to um, a, a sibling in their family or someone in their family at a different encampment to, to fit their way into the system there. Um, so that's a very flexible system and a, a bilateral or cognatic system works really well in that situation. Um, I don't know that I put this in here. I feel like I probably didn't, but uh, there's other types of resonance patterns as well. Types of patterns where when two people get married, they will move in with the, um, the wife's mother's family. And that is like in, in her village and that is called matrilocal. And on the other side, for, for a patrilineal type of society, uh, oftentimes newlyweds will move in with the husband's father's side. So that would be a uh, patrilocal residence pattern. Um, and you can have neolocal, which is what um, a lot of us do nowadays in, again, in, in the so-called West or the global North or however you want to phrase it. Um, which is where when you get married, you, you go off and, and have your family in, a, in your own home. Um, that's called neo-local. So you can mix these things. Oftentimes a patrilineal will go with patrilocal residence patterns, but it would be possible, I suppose, to have a patrilineal group with a matrilocal residence system. Um, I think that would be extremely rare, but it's possible. Um, you can be patrilineal and neolocal. Um, so anyway, now just to test your understanding of this, how many people are in ego's matrilineage? So this is ego. How many people trace their ancestry through the same woman in ego's matrilineage? So these are only people who are related um, through through blood to the same woman. So take a look at that, count it up, and I will, I will show you the answer. So while you're looking at that, I'm gonna have a sip of coffee, even though it's evening. <sighs> Keep counting. I gave you a few choices there. It's one of those. Okay, two sips are up. Let's go through this together. So ego is related to their um, siblings, obviously, through blood. Right? So aside from ego, so far we're at three people who are in ego's matrilineage, right? Because ego and his siblings all have the same mother, right? Okay, she's in the matrilineage, okay? Now, her brother, that's her brother, in other words, Ego's uncle, um, also has the same mother as Ego's mother, right? So all of these people are related to Ego's grandmother, maternal grandmother, including Ego, right? Now, who is related to Ego's grandmother's mother? Well, Ego's grandmother's siblings, so Ego, Ego's great aunt and uncle, and uh, Ego's great grandmother, okay? So these are, these are all people who are related through blood 
um, in this case, because the diagram doesn't keep going and going and going, to um, Ego's great uh, grandmother. Okay. Um, additionally, sorry, I, I forgot I wasn't finished. Um, because this woman here, Ego's great aunt, I guess, um, also has the same mother. Her, uh, her children are going to be part of that match lineage. And this woman's children as well. Okay. So all of these people can claim um, ancestry through the maternal line to this woman. Okay. Now it's a little tricky because uh, why, for example, are these children not part of the matrilineage? Well, because these children are part of their mother's matrilineage, okay? And her matrilineage isn't shown in this diagram. So it's traced through the mother's line, okay? So even though this person, Ego's uncle, is part of the same matrilineage, his wife is not, and therefore his children are not. Okay. I hope that I hope I didn't make it more confusing than it needs to be. Now let's look at how many people are in, are in ego's patrilineage. So in this in this case, we're using this as ego. How many people are in ego's patrilineage aside from ego? Okay. So I'll let you count. My phone's been blowing up, so I'm gonna I'm gonna answer that while you're counting. Keep counting. I feel a sneeze coming on. Don't worry, you can't get COVID through the computer. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, let's let's look. Okay, ego. There's ego. Ego's siblings have the same father as Ego, right? So they're in the same patrilineage. Ego's father is in that patrilineage. Okay, now, Ego's mother, not part of that patrilineage because Ego's mother is part of her father's patrilineage. Okay, and her father is not on this diagram. Okay, so, so who else has the same father as, e as Ego's father? Oh, well, Ego's aunt here, uh, because this is this is the father of both of these two, right? Now, what about what about these children? No, no, because they belong to their father's patrilineage. Okay, and this father is not part of Ego's patrilineage. Okay. Okay, who else? Who else? Um, what about this this person? No, she belongs to her father's patrilineage. Okay, so we have these two here. So that would be egos, um, egos, egos, great aunt and uncle, because they are all children of egos' great grandfather here. Okay, so in this case, there are eight people in this patrilineage shown on the graph aside from ego, okay? Now there's a couple other uh, interesting types of arrangements. Um, and it, this is, again, this is just like a crash course in, in certain kinship arrangements. Um, there's something called leveret marriage or marriage by leveret, um, which is something that is fairly common in patrilineal societies. Now, if you have a Judeo-Christian background, you may be familiar with some of this from the Old Testament or the Pentateuch. Um, it's it's where a if a if a husband is deceased, um, then the wife is encouraged to marry the husband's brother. Okay, so you see here. Here's the wife, here's the husband, the husband dies, and she's encouraged to marry any, any marriageable male in the husband's uh, 
among the husband's siblings, okay? Now, why is that? Uh, that is because in a patrilineal society, right, all of the rights, responsibilities, property, wealth, inheritance pass through that male line. So to maintain continuity so that, for example, ego here is still part of her father's patrilineage, um, it's encouraged for her mother to marry her uncle if her father dies, okay? That way, um, Ego's mother still has the same kinds of, of ties to that family. It, it's keeping their, their lineages kind of together through a final ties. Ego still gets the same kind of uh, benefits from her patrilineage, um, so it, 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 it binds that together instead of when the husband dies, everything just, just kind of blows up and has to, has to sort of reform. Okay. Now there's two distinctions that are sometimes made, uh, with regard to cousins. Now, I don't know about any of you folks, but for me, cousins were cousins were cousins. And as I said, I didn't even know most of my cousins. Uh, but a distinction can be made between what are called cross cousins and parallel cousins. This is a little confusing, but bear with me. So here's our ego. This is ego's mother and ego's father. Uh, now, if we look at uh, ego's mother's sister, okay, so that's ego's aunt, but specifically ego's mother's sister, her kids are considered parallel cousins. In this case, it's because they are cousins in the same matrilineage as Ego, right? Now, Ego's father's brother's children are also parallel cousins because they belong to the same patrilineage as Ego, okay? Now, Ego's mother's brother's children do not belong to the same patrilineage, right? That's why I made this circle a different color because these ones belong to their mother's matrilineage, right? So these are not called parallel cousins, they're called cross cousins. And Ego's father's sister's children, they belong to their father's patrilineage, not to Ego's patrilineage, so they are called cross cousins. Now, in some societies, parallel cousins are seen as being more closely related than cross cousins um, because they are part of one of your lineages, okay? So, a, a way to think of this is the children of a person's parents' same-sex siblings, so fathers, brothers, children, or mothers, sisters, children, are called parallel cousins. And children of a parent's opposite-sex siblings, so a father's sister's children or a mother's brother's children, are cross-cousins. Um, now, let's, let's show you how this works in action. Um, there's something called the Iroquois system, which... I don't know if it was practiced by all tribes uh, in part of the Iroquois Confederacy, but um, or Confederation, but uh, but it was so called by one of the nineteenth um, century um, anthropologists that was that was studying um, kinship, um, and so in the Iroquois system, here we have ego. This is Ego's brother, so B for brother. This is Ego's sister, Z for sister, because S has been reserved for son, of course. Uh, M for mother, F for father. Okay, and these are Ego's parallel cousins here, right? Because they're Ego's mother's sister's children or father's brother's children. Those are parallel cousins, and the others are cross cousins. So, uh, for the... Uh, parallel cousins, Ego would call their aunt and uncle on that side mother and father. And they would call their cousins on that side 
in this case, brothers, because they're both males, so brother or sister, right? Same over here. These parallel, uh, these parallel cousins would be brother and sister, and their aunt and uncle on that side would be called mother and father. Why? Because they're, since they're parallel cousins, they're viewed as being uh, more closely related, and so they actually kind of socially see their uncle and aunt as being like their mother and father as well and their cousins as being siblings. Uh, whereas for their cross cousins, um, the uh, siblings uh, and spouses uh, here of, their, of the parents are called uncle and aunt, and the cousins are just called cousins, right? Same, same over here. Now, there are some societies in which um, and these are typically, I think, in smaller scale societies, but there are some societies in which you are actually encouraged to marry one of your cross cousins, but highly discouraged from marrying your parallel cousins. And that's because if you marry a cross cousin, you're bringing a new connection to a new lineage, right? These cousins are not part of either a matrilineage or a patrilineage that ego is a part of, right? So ego in some societies would be encouraged to marry her uh, male cross cousin over here because he has a different patrilineage and he has a different matrilineage. Yeah. But marrying a parallel cousin, this is why you call them like brothers and sisters, is not uh, looked upon kindly, right? It's like marrying one of your siblings. Um, and that, again, is to form alliances between um, between lineages, okay? And because you're not seen as being as closely related, right? Um, there's other kind of, other places where kinship ties, like especially fictive kinship ties can develop are in certain secret societies or, or sodalities. A sodality is just a special purpose group. Um, sometimes it's organized by age, sex, maybe a combination of both, like an age class thing where males of a certain age group are in this group together or females of a certain age group uh, on the basis of an economic role or personal interest. Like, again, like a fraternity or a sorority that could almost be considered like a type of sodality. Um, oftentimes in a society, a sodality will be um, a, a group that that carries out a particular function, whether it's a, a dance group or a group that does ritual things or a, a, um, maybe like a, like a warrior type society. Um, and then there's, there's also another well-documented case are some secret societies of, of certain West African uh, cultures. Uh, those are types of sodalities. Uh, where they, they're bringing people together from actually different kinship groups, uh, but they're part of usually like age and sex classes um, where young men and women are initiated into social, social adulthood, meaning like it's not strictly recognizing biological difference between youth and adulthood. It's also recognizing you're taking on the roles of adults at this point. And in some of these secret societies, you gain knowledge that people outside of the society don't have, and therefore you are bound to different expectations and responsibilities to other members of that society. So that can be part of the kinship as well. Okay, so that's it. I'm going to end it now. I will be back soon with a video on marriage. Thanks for sticking with me, and I'll see you soon.